Hi, this is the first in a series of videos to introduce you to the main ideas of this fantastic book, Leon Trotsky's History of the Russian Revolution. And I suppose the question to ask to start with is why study such a thick tome as this? What is so important about the history of the Russian Revolution in general and Leon Trotsky's book about it in particular. What did you think? Well, I would say, first and foremost, because the Russian Revolution of 1917 has to be one of the most significant events in history. Most revolutionary socialists would agree that it remains the key event to study, understand and to learn from. To prepare for future events. Because there hasn't been, certainly before Trotsky wrote and up to now ever since, any such successful revolution that has led to a genuine workers state. Yes, there have been other times in history where capitalism has been overthrown, say Cuba and China for example, but not revolutions where the working class was in the lead and therefore not, as in Russia in 1917, leading to the creation of a democratic workers state. In fact, if you take the very first sentence of the preface of the book, Trotsky himself says, during the first two months of 1917, Russia was still a Romanov monarchy. Eight months later, the Bolsheviks stood at the helm. You will not find another such sharp turn in history, especially if you remember that it involves a nation of 150 million people. It is clear that the events of 1917, whatever you think of them, deserve study. I think that says it all. This book by Trotsky is a real must read for anyone who is serious about understanding the strategy and tactics that the Bolsheviks applied, how they changed their approach and demands as events unfolded in 1917, and how that approach therefore led to a successful revolution in October, or in reality, of course, as the Byzantine calendar they were using said it was October in November uh, 1917. Why also this particular book? Because of course it's written by one of the key theoreticians and leaders of that revolution. And it's worth not skipping over the notes at the beginning by Max Eastman, the translator, where he quotes from Kamenev's official history of the Bolshevik party, describing the author Trotsky as, for example, first of all, the elected president of the first ever Petersburg Workers' Soviet in 1905, the trial run in effect for the 1917 revolution. It notes that he was part of the tiny minority of Marxists who maintained their internationalist outlook at the start of World War I and who participated with Lenin in the 1915 Zimmerwald conference and like Lenin then returned to Russia in 1917. He was then again elected president of the Petersburg Soviet in September 1917, at the point when the Bolsheviks first won a majority uh, in that Soviet, and then of course led the insurrection of October itself. There are many other points within that translator's note that are worth looking at. For example, there's an outline from Lunacharsky about Trotsky's personality and his particular skills, making the point that it complemented Lenin. They both had their strengths and weaknesses, but together were the key organisers and leaders of that revolution. And perhaps the final reason to study Trotsky's history of the Russian Revolution, it is absolutely full of key theoretical points, not least, as Kamenev raises in that uh, translator's note by Eastman, his theory of the permanent revolution, but the book is also full of absolutely cracking quotes. And I want to finish this section by just reading some of those uh, from the preface of the book, which, is, which alone 
is worth reading. And the first quote I want to raise is that some people might say, might say that Trotsky's history isn't going to be impartial enough, isn't going to be objective enough, because he's actually involved personally in the revolution. And Trotsky takes up that accusation in advance and says, is it necessary to have the so-called historian's impartiality? Nobody has yet clearly explained what this impartiality consists of. The serious and critical reader will not want a treacherous impartiality, which offers him a cup of conciliation with a well-settled poison of reactionary hate at the bottom. But a scientific conscientiousness, which for its sympathies and antipathies, open and undisguised, seek support in an honest study of the facts, a determination of their real connections, an exposure of the causal laws of their movement. And that is what I believe this book does fantastically. And we need to understand what those causal laws are. Now, just in that preface, which alone is worth reading, Trotsky raises four key ideas that are important to understanding the rest of the book. First of all, Trotsky explains what a revolution is about. And the first point that he raises that revolution is first and foremost about the participation of the masses. And actually on the back of the book, this particular version, it uses this fantastic quote. The most undeniable feature of our revolution is the direct interference of the masses in historic events. In ordinary times, the state, be it monarchical or democratic, elevates itself above the nation. And history is made by specialists in that line of business. Kings, ministers, bureaucrats, parliamentarians, journalists. But at those crucial moments when the old order becomes no longer endurable to the masses, they break over the barriers, excluding them from the political arena, sweep aside their traditional representatives and create by their own interference the initial groundwork for a new regime. The history of a revolution is for us, first and foremost, a history of the forcible entrance of the masses into the realm of rulership over their own destiny. That is an important point. But he goes on with the preface to raise a few more important things. He makes clear that a revolution can't be explained solely in terms of sort of long term economic uh, uh, explanations of the economic base that was there in Russia in 1917, because events take place too quickly. He explains that the dynamic of revolutionary events is directly determined by swift, intense and passionate changes in the psychology of classes which have already formed themselves before the revolution. In other words, a revolution is when the masses catch up with the reality of the economic situation, where they make leaps and bounds. And as Trotsky says, the swift changes of mass views and moods in an epoch of revolution thus derive not from the flexibility of man's mind, but just the opposite, from its deep conservatism, the chronic lag of ideas and relations behind new objective conditions, right up to the moment where the latter crash over people. That's what creates, in a period of revolution, that leaping movement of ideas and passions, which seems to the police mind a mere result of the activities of demagogues. So what do you think? Does that make sense? That it's human conservatism that results in revolution? It's an idea that's worth discussing because revolutions are about, if you like, that conservative side of the human mind suddenly being overthrown, that ideas catch up with reality in sudden leaps, in leaps and bounds, and as Trotsky says, the fundamental political process of the revolution thus consists in the gradual comprehension by a class of the problems arising from the social crisis, the active orientation of the masses 
by a method of successive approximations. But Trotsky explains that that won't happen just by the masses themselves, that something else is required. And he also has a very well-known quote about the role of a revolutionary party. Trotsky says that only on the basis of a study of political processes in the masses themselves can we understand the role of parties and leaders. They constitute not an independent, but nevertheless a very important element in the process. Without a guiding organisation, the energy of the masses would dissipate like steam, not enclosed in a piston box. But nevertheless, what drives things is not the piston or the box, but the steam. That's a crucial explanation for revolutionaries to remember. Even if a steam engine is somewhat out of date, it very much still applies. And he goes on to say what I think is an even more important one sentence to remember. For better or worse, a revolutionary party bases its tactics upon a calculation of the changes of mass consciousness. The history of Bolshevism demonstrates that such a calculation, at least in its rough features, can be made. And that is the job of a serious revolutionary. In the discussions, at meetings, on street stalls, in the pub with your mates, judging what the moods are, how those moods are changing, the different moods within different sections of the class on which to judge, then the tactics and the demands that you put forward. And judging the stage at which that mass consciousness has reached is absolutely crucial, as we shall see, for revolutionaries to judge the moment, not to go too far ahead of the masses, but neither to lag behind and to miss the revolutionary moment. Because as Trotsky says, the different stages of a revolutionary process, in which the more extreme always supersedes the less, express the growing pressure to the left of the masses, so long as the swing of the movement does not run into objective obstacles. When it does, there begins a reaction. Disappointments of the different layers of the revolutionary class, growth of indifferentism, and therewith the strengthening of the position of the counter-revolutionary forces. So the moment has to be judged, or when the revolutionary moment has been reached, and not to allow the counter-revolution to instead defeat the revolution. But the final point he makes also that I wanted to raise now is that nevertheless, uh, it is conditions that determine consciousness, no matter, as Trotsky says, how the idealists rage. But the, but the final point that Trotsky makes, which I think has to be borne in mind, is that we absolutely have to learn from the history of the Re Russian Revolution. But we also have to understand the particular historic peculiarities of Russia, as Trotsky puts it. So we don't study the history of the Russian Revolution in order to study it as a blueprint, to repeat in exactly the same way, the same demands and expect the same stages to develop. That might not be the case. What we need to do is to study the Russian Revolution in order to work out how it was that the Bolsheviks successfully if you like, calculated those changes of mass consciousness so that we can do the same in the particular conditions that we face today. Trotsky explains that we ought to be able to find the premises of both the February Revolution and October Revolution, which replaced it in the historic conditions which formed Russia, her economy, her classes, and her state. And since the greatest enigma is the fact that a backward country was the first to place the proletariat in power, it behoves us to seek the solution of that enigma in the peculiarities of that backward country. And that's what we need to do now by starting on the first chapters of the book, which explain those particular peculiarities.